Astronomers always discover something new, something unexpected. I have every expectation that gravitational observatories will see something funny, and that'll send theorists scurrying to explain. And so if you've got one of these laser interferometers with the arms that are perpendicular, and the wave comes through, it's going to stretch one and shrink the other. Um, now, this is where it gets really fascinating, because you work out the strength of a typical gravitational wave from an in-spiral of two black holes in, in a nearby galaxy or something like that, how much is that movement? And the answer is it's equivalent to the width of a human hair in the distance to the nearest star. I mean, isn't that staggering? <laughs> so you've got this interferometer. These things are kilometers in size, and the light goes back and forth so many times, and they've got you know huge mirrors weighing more than a person, and they can de detect the motion of a mirror like that, the, the, the mirror itself moves less than the nucleus of an atom. So that is really cutting edge technology. I got interested in this stuff in the late 70s. I wrote a book on it uh, called The Search of Gravity Waves back in 1980, and I never thought in my life I would see uh, these things detected. But in 2015, bingo! Uh, the first gravitational wave event was detected. A pair of black holes in a galaxy, I think, 1,300 light years away, um, uh, 36, roughly 30-something 30 solar masses, these black holes, uh, spiraled together and collided. Um, and so this was uh, you know, a triumph of technology, um, but an incredible vindication, because it was nearly 100 years after Einstein had predicted that there exist gravitational waves. A uh, hundred years, uh, a lot of people thought, well, are they really there? But sure enough, they are. And uh, uh, there, there was a lot of fanfare. But it wasn't very long before they saw another event, and then another event, and another event, and so on. And this has now uh, established itself in the last few years as a new branch of astronomy. So having got these amazing instruments that can detect gravitational waves, um, what, what are they good for? Well, I've already mentioned the in-spiral of black holes and neutron stars. Uh, and there was one extraordinary event uh, a few years ago where two neutron stars uh, came together and collided. And the gravitational burst of waves from that was detected at the same time as a satellite detected a flash of gamma rays. Uh, and uh, then there were, there were optical measurements as well. And so uh, it was uh, clever people figured out that the coalescence of these two neutron stars, which very violent event, uh, created uh, a large number of elements, uh, particularly the element gold. And so this caught people's imagination. More gold was made in that microsecond that those two neutron stars um, merged together than if the entire Earth was made of gold, more than an Earth's mass worth. And so um, that is part of the story of the origin of the elements in the universe. And this can not only be studied just as that one burst. But in Australia, there's a um, proposal for a system called NEMO, which, if I remember, stands for Neutron Extreme Matter Observatory, which would drill into the fine details of that. Because when those two neutron stars collide, they recreate in a, in a microsecond the conditions that would have prevailed very early on in the Big Bang. So you're sort of doing, exper not experimental, but observational physics of one of the earliest epochs of the universe. And you need the gravitational signature of that to be able to see exactly what is happening uh, with those neutron star coalescences. But I started by saying that we might be able to hear the Big Bang as well as see the flash from it. Uh, and there, it's a, a very different story, because uh, the Big Bang was a long time ago. The universe has expanded a lot since. And um, the rumble, if you like, of that uh, primordial explosion, that rumble the, the gravitational waves have been stretched by the expansion of the universe. So they're now sort of huge, but there's a proposal uh, to send an interferometer into space. Well, constructed in space, it's called LISA, laser something or other. Um, and it will be uh, mirrors, which will be like millions of kilometers apart, and, the, and it will be an interferometer in space. So we'll be able to detect uh, gravitational waves of extremely long wavelengths like those coming from the Big Bang. So that's the next step in this technology. Uh, and the other 
just general point is that every time there's been an advance in astronomy with the instruments, uh, the, first of all, the optical telescope, then the radio telescope, and then all the other, you know, the satellites to take X-rays and gamma rays and so on. Astronomers always discover something new, something unexpected. And so I have every expectation that gravitational observatories will, f will see something funny going on. What's that? You know, that we, we never expected that. This funny signature, these waves with these peculiar properties, um, and that'll send theorists scurrying to explain that's a new type of object out there in space or a new type of physical phenomenon. There's one that some colleagues of mine get excited by. You may have heard of string theory about uh, super strings, everything's made out of strings. Uh, uh, there are other types of strings, not those strings, cosmic strings. Uh, these would be like threads that would have been produced just after the Big Bang. They're like uh, almost knots in the, in the fields that permeate the universe, um, but one dimensional, and these would be long threads um, may be forming loops, maybe stretching right across the universe, and they, they wriggle around like this, prolific source of gravitational waves. So if there are cosmic strings out there doing their wriggle, uh, then that, that will produce very distinctive types of gravitational waves. And then there's one last thing I can't resist mentioning, because um, lo a lot of young people find all this stuff really exciting. And uh, an undergraduate, she's just be beginning, so she'd be like 18, uh, she uh, emailed me to say, uh, I'm really excited by uh, the work you're doing, and can I do a project with you? And so we sat down, and I said, well, what are you interested in? She said, well, uh, gravitational waves, and I'm also interested in wormholes. Well, wormholes are like black holes, but different, because in a black hole, it's a one-way journey to nowhere. You fall in, and you don't come out again. A wormhole has an exit as well as an entrance, uh, so it's sort of superficial. It's a massive object, and you fall in, but you go through and you come out somewhere else. And uh, those of you old enough to remember the movie Contact will remember, you know what a wormhole looks like because Jodie Foster fell through one. And it's, it's like going on the London Underground. Um, and you come out, you come out somewhere else. Uh, very hypothetical. I happen to have uh, just come from a conference in Rome with Roger Penrose, uh, who will be talking here tomorrow. Uh, and that was all about wormholes and do they really exist and could you turn them into time machines and so on. And that's all very fascinating and highly speculative. But, uh, but this, uh, this young lady uh, is interested in what would be the gravitational wave signature from wormholes. Supposing a wormhole swallows a black hole, it's, sort of, it's in the throat of this thing and spits it out the other side. Or maybe two wormholes spiral together, hit each other. You know, what, what would... Um, what would that be like? What type of gravitational wave signature? So she asked me this. I said, well, I haven't a clue. Um, but it turns out that, that, that also at this Rome conference was Kip Thorne, who just got the Nobel Prize, uh, I think last year, for gravitational waves. He was the, like the driving force behind the uh, laser gravitational wave interferometers. But he was also the architect of this whole wormhole theory uh, because he developed the theory of wormholes because Carl Sagan, who, who wrote, a famous astronomer, uh, wrote, a, the, wrote the book Contact, on which the movie was based. And anyone who likes science fiction will know how boring it is that it takes so long to get to another, another star system, you know, thousands of years at present rocket speed, but even light would take you know, many, many years to go between star systems. Wouldn't it be handy if you had something like a stargate or a shortcut that could get us from Earth to the other side of the galaxy you know, in a few minutes, rather than having to wait, take millions of years to fly there. Uh, so it was a science fiction idea, but he uh, asked Kip Thorne at the California Institute of Technology to check it out. So Kip and his students said, well, you know, maybe if you did this, did that, uh, you could actually make a wormhole. And they soon realized if you could make the wormhole, it could be turned into a time machine. So I'm sort of very much off topic. The point being that this one man uh, is the world expert on wormholes, uh, and the world expert on gravitational waves. So I said to him, Kip, my undergraduate student has asked me to ask you what would be the gravitational wave signature from a wormhole. And he said, I haven't a clue. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that, that's an open question. Um, so we'll, we'll see how, how she gets on with her project. Yeah. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.